Okay. All right. Um, so first of all, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I got interested in this work quite some time ago. Um, I was uh, a postdoc at Roger Penrose working on special optical light fields, and um, he was interested in gravitational induced decoherence. Uh, then I went to Innsbruck for some time, did quantum optics experiments on quantum teleportation and all that. And then I got back to Oxford, um, starting a, a little group in quantum optics. And uh, Roger Penrose one day literally came to the lab and he said, we really have to talk about this experiment that I want to do with satellites and UV, um, X-ray photons bouncing around. And I know people at NASA and we can do that. And I thought, OK, let's calm down. Let's see if we can do something in, on an optical table. And uh, so we, we thought about an experiment, and it was published uh, in 2003. And the main idea of that experiment was uh, start with a single photon. And the single photon we put in a superposition of being in one arm or in the other arm. And if this photon enters uh, either this cavity or that cavity, then the superposition could be turned into entanglement with the motion of a mirror. So if the photon is here, the mirror stays at rest. If the photon enters this cavity, and if the mirror is weak en is, is uh, small enough, if the spring constants are, are weak enough, if you can trap the light long enough, then the light radiation of a single photon should be able to displace this mirror more than its ground state wave packet or the relevant size that uh, Roger Penrose wanted to investigate. Um, so the question is, can we build such an experiment? And um, what we proposed was first to try to create uh, a superposition uh, entanglement between this cantilever and the photon. And the experiment we planned, and we're still working on, and, and others are working on by now, um, would still be several orders away from where Roger Penrose wants to be. Um, but I've been really astonished by how much progress has been made in the last few years in different directions in actually uh, entering the regime where Roger Penrose makes some interesting predictions. So I've been focusing with uh, part of my research group on the first making this part of the experimental setup. And it started back in 2006 with simply cutting out a small mirror and glue it onto the tip of an uh, atomic force or on an atom atomic force microscope tip. And we had reasonable opt or finesse, optical finesse. The mechanical cues were of the, of the order of 100,000. And um, we want to stay at low uh, resonance frequencies, about uh, 100 kilohertz. Then we have way too much mass on the support. So we have to replace the atomic force uh, cantilever by much smaller arms. So. Recently, we started to make these structures uh, in the clean rooms at UCSB, where we grow the material ourselves on top of um, silicon uh, nitride uh, membranes, and then we can etch away so we get uh, tiny arms. Now, this got us quite some improvement in the cube, but the finesse was still poor. And that had to do with the fact that the coatings that we could make ourselves at UCSB are OK. But it really is an art. You need a specialized company to get the highest possible uh, coatings. So we redesigned our fabrication so that during part of the, of the steps, we can have the material coated. And um, our latest structures have uh, a better finesse. Um, we don't have the highest finesse yet. We don't want that, because otherwise we would get too high a cavity that would be too sensitive to um, motion, and we have to develop a cryostat, a cryostat system where we can do optical measurements. So we don't want the highest possible optical finesse to start with, because we, we have to develop many other things. So um, those structures uh, we have now, and it turns out that they have different properties once they are installed in a cryostat, the, the way you clamp structures, the way you cool structures. Um, there, there are many te technical points. Um, that come into play. Sorry? We, no. The, actually, the modes we are more worried about is because this is a 100 nanometer thin silicon nitride. 
and the, the rest of the support is actually We, we, we use the trampoline mode, that is the lowest frequency yeah. mode, and, and the other modes are still far away. Yeah. yeah. Um, but there are other modes in the, in the silicon nitride membrane that might play a role. So but we, we'll come to that um, because we do have some measurement results on these structures since a, since a month or two, and we try to understand them. Um, but I'll come to that uh, at the end. Um, so we started out in, in, in vacuum. And uh, we built some cryogenic compatible optical structures, but um, they failed horribly uh, a, a year ago or one and a half year ago. So we redesigned everything with different translation systems, uh, much higher stability. And with this system, which is basically one solid block with, with um, new designed motors, um, we're actually able to align an optical system at millikelvin using seven uh, translation systems, and that, that's a difficult part to do that in a stable way. Um, we do everything fiber coupled, so our cryostat is actually uh, immersed in the dewer, and we, we just have to play with the signals that we get out. So also our detector is uh, at low temperatures, which uh, there are several issues with um, the amplifiers, and we're learning many things that, as a quantum optics person, we were not familiar with, but in Leiden, we have a lot of support um, from technicians and experts in this field. Okay, so why? Why? This is a tough experiment. So this brings me back to uh, Roger Penrose, and I think the real reason why he's pointing at here, this is a conformal infinity. Right? So. We had the big picture before. This is even a bigger picture, what I will show you in a minute. Um, so the, there is this paper by Roger Penrose, um, wavefunction collapse as a real gravitational effect. And there is a footnote. And actually, this footnote has been, as far as I understand from him, uh, the real motivation for him to, uh, to propose even this, this gravitational-induced decoherence. And, uh, I can hardly read it, and I can certainly not understand it. Um, there's also other strong evidence that nature's own choice of quantization procedure for general relativity must be fundamentally non-standard. This is evidence. Uh, this evidence is to be found in the gross time asymmetry that occurs in structural space-time singularities. OK, and footnote. Um, so I've asked him a few times to explain this. Um, and um, then he starts, indeed, talking about the big picture, um, it's, it's really astonishing that we can, from our current understanding um, of, of quantum theories, quantum field theories, go back in time to basically the, the beginning of our universe, the Big Bang. And we know um, that, at that at the initial stage, fields were massless. Okay, So that, that's an important observation. In the beginning, there was light, as they say. Uh, it happens to be so. Um, but the big picture continues in the future. And it seems that everything will eventually uh, come to, uh, to black holes. And those black holes will actually evaporate, ending up in fields again with uh, mass zero. So um, actually, Roger Penrose wrote a recent uh, another book, which I think will be out soon or is out. It's all about the evolution of the universe from beginning to end and back to the beginning. Um, and an important role is played by conformal symmetry. So if we have massless field equations, for example, of this form, um, then we know, first of all, there's Lorentz symmetry, um, Poincaré symmetry, but there's another important symmetry, and that is conformal symmetry, which means that if you scale up the metric in some uh, way, such that you preserve locally all angles, then if you do that, you still obey the same uh, massless wave equation. So if there is no mass in the equation, if this term is not there, then conformal symmetries are applied. And, and nowadays, uh, conformal symmetries are everywhere in, in string theory. It plays a very important role. Um, but massless fields 
have conformal symmetry. Okay, so this is basically a, a picture that you can conformally stretch to infinite, or actually it was made the other way around. You have an infinite sheet with this pattern, and then you can shrink it conformally so that the boundary infin infinity becomes uh, at, a f at, a, at a fixed uh, dimension, at a fixed size. A more familiar way of a conformal transformation is stereographic projection, where you have a plane and you take, the, say, the North Pole and you project down each point of the sphere to the, um, to the plane. And you get a one-to-one -one correspondence. And if you have some pattern here, here this pattern, the structure will have the same angle. So this is a conformal transformation. And the important part is that in such transformations, you often have to add this one point from which you do your projection. And this point represents infinity in all directions. And if you have a methless equation, you might as well say that you deal with solutions on this sphere rather than in solutions in this plane. And you have the, the strange thing that you can walk past infinity here, uh, but still satisfy your, your uh, equations in, in, in a natural way. And this you can also do in three dimensions or in, in, in Minkowski space. So the idea is that the final state of the universe will be conformal invariant. This is a conformal invariant state, and that would allow rescaling this to your uh, beginning. So you get a sort of cycle of the universe, and um, Roger Penrose goes as far as to claim that from the cosmic background radiation, there are some holes and patterns in there. From that, we should be able to deduce the positions of the black holes that evaporated in the previous uh, universe. So this is the big picture. Um, and I still haven't understood why he needs uh, gravitation used decoherence. But part of the argument has to do with, in this part, we're talking with increase of entropy. There's really uh, um, a direction in time def uh, uh, defined. But at the end, we want to come to a state that is conformally identical to the initial state. So something must counteract um, this direction of time, this increase uh, in entropy. And so from that, he, he postulated, or he, he knew, or he wanted to see a state reduction process, something that, that counteracts the increase of, of, of phase space. And then, having the problem of the quantum projection postulate, it was obvious that he would s search for a link between the two and conjecture that the, the, the projection is actually a physical process and that he needs to complete this, this picture of a uh, cycling universe. Okay. Bigger than this picture, I don't think you will get. Uh, <laughs> so actually, these conformal symmetries, I've been in intrigued by them very much. And in fact, at the moment, I, I have one student. Uh, uh, we, we're studying. Uh, these special, special solutions of light that actually make use of this symmetry. And it's actually possible to have light knotted in such a way that E fields are linked to each other, B fields are linked to each other, and you fill the whole space. This is work uh, to, together with uh, William Irvine. Uh, I have no time to talk about that, but these conformal properties are really uh, spectacular. OK, so back to Penrose and to the main argument given in this paper. Although, as I said before, he has much deeper reasons to suspect that there is a, a reduction mechanism. And uh, now I want to follow his lines by saying it must be some gravitational mechanism. Okay? And the idea is that uh, Penrose points out that there is a conflict between the general covariance principle and the basic uh, postulate of quantum superpositions or describing particles by a wave function of x, y, z, and t. And if this wave function has, uh, describes the possibility of a particle to, to be in different places, you actually don't have one space-time structure because if the particle is here, you have a different x, y, z, t structure than if the particle is there. Still, in quantum mechanics, we write down one wave function of x, y, z, and t. So there's something to me, reasonably obvious wrong. The question is, what do you do with it? But uh, I think there is a, a clear point that, that something is, is wrong. Um, so here, it's, it's 
what I just said uh, formulated a bit more precise. So quantum mechanically, you would look for uh, the Schrodinger equation for eigenstates um, that are eigenvalues of the derivative with respect to time. So if we have a massive object that is in a superposition of two places, but each superposition is, uh, is represented by uh, this, part, this wave function and that wave function, then we're dealing with this wave function if the particle is in one place, this with the other, and now we put it in a superposition, and the question is, what do I have as my operator for the time derivative? In fact, this operator is not um, very accurately def defined. In fact, there is some uncertainty in the definition of the time derivative, and this uncertainty is directly related to an uncertainty of energy that is associated to the state, and an uncertainty on en in energy um, would result in an uncertainty in time by, by Heisenberg uh, uncertainty relation. Okay. So, there is something wrong. What can you postulate about the, the effect of it? So, consider we have this superposition, and F and F prime are the, the, the classical gravitational forces per unit test mass resulting from the particle being represented by the state of psi and, and of the particle represented by the state of phi. Okay. So Penrose postulates, and this is basically the only reasonable thing, you want to get some positive number out of it, you take the difference of these fields as generated by this, the two possible positions of the mass uh, squared to get a, a, a positive number, and you integrate over space. And then for dimensional reasons, you have to put uh, g in. And if you talk to Penrose, he says, I'm only not quite sure about the 4 pi. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, but this is the way he calculates a cert, uh, an, an, an energy uncertainty that is associated with putting a massive object in a superposition. Or say it differently, you want to form a, a blister in space-time. You want to have um, two different space-time structures and this calculation tells you, okay, it's fine, but only uh, for a certain amount of time, namely uh, h bar divided by this gravitational self-energy. Okay. Now, this is nothing like a, a, a pure theory. Uh, it, it's a postulate, and um, it's surprising that other people like Diozzi have, have come up with exactly the same equation just by saying... Um, what could it be if I have a superposition? What, what could give me something of the form of an energy? And um, you again arrive at this expression. Okay. Now, if I have an object with some total mass and with it made up of, of little uh, mass particles like the silicon nuclei, um, what, what do I get from this calculation? And um, so in the limit that the separation is larger than, the, uh, say, the diameter of your elementary particles in the system, you end up with an equation like this. And um, there is one small problem, which is actually quite a big problem. Um, you have to know what is the mass and what is the mass distribution of a piece of material to do the calculation that Penrose uh, proposes. So if we have some crystal, we could think of it composite out of, of atoms. And uh, what should we take? Well, we know that most of the mass is in the nucleus. So I've looked into that a little bit further, how the mass distribution is in the nucleus. Well, you have a fairly dense packing of protons and, and, and neutrons. And uh, if you want to describe the structure of the neutrons and the protons, you have to uh, look into quantum brome dynamics where you have uh, quarks and gluons. And it turns out that actually the mass of a neutron is for 99% actually uh, the energy stored in the virtual gluons that holds uh, the things together. And they are indeed sort of distributed over a, a fuzzy ball. So it's known that the, the the nucleus, or the protons, they really are some smeared out energy distribution and smeared out mass distribution. 
and the nucleus themselves is also quite a dense um, this, uh, configuration of the neutrons and protons. So maybe the best thing to take is indeed um, the size of the nucleus. Um, so that is one part that you could take in such a calculation. It's also been suggested that we should take this, the size of the ground state wave packet. And in fact, that is what most people quote if they refer to the, this work of Penrose, that uh, the size that is relevant is the size of the ground state wave packet. Um, I'm, I'm not at all sure about it. Um, if you were to put these numbers in, then according to Penrose for the systems that I will discuss, we expect decoherence times of one one millisecond if this is the relevant size and something uh, several orders larger if um, the ground state wave packet is the size. So in, in, in fact, I think experiments might get closer to the interesting regime um, if this is the relevant size than, than what people are quoting these days. Okay, um, just, just for comparison, if you do the calculation here for C60 experiments, then the time for decoherence, according to this gravitation induced decoherence, would be 10 to the 10 seconds. So, way, way, way beyond the time scales that these experiments uh, take. Okay. So, to briefly summarize, we have the mass distribution in one place, we have some space time curvature. If it's in a different place, we have a different space time curvature. You can calculate a sort of gravitational self energy, which is sort of related to if you have test particles moving through here, what would be the, the uncertainty in, in gravitational fields that they feel? That will give you this value, then you use Heisenberg's uncertainty to calculate this delta t. Okay. All right, so the experiment that we're working on for quite some time now, and um, we've seen many al alternatives, but I still think that for the di direction where I want to go to, having a single photon creating a, a superposition, we are sort of still forced in this, uh, to think in, in this type of uh, experiment. Um, we have this two cavity uh, interferometer. Uh, we have the familiar Hamiltonian. And I don't want to go in detail there. And, and first theory about such systems were already proposed in those papers. We consider the mirror initially to be in uh, a coherent state, preferably as, as close as possible to uh, a zero uh, phonon state, but it will be in some um, coherent uh, state. The initial state of the experiment would be the photon in arm B or the photon in arm A with the initial state of the mirror given here. And then, as function of time, because of the radiation pressure of this single photon, the mirror becomes entangled with the photon. And the important part is that after one period of oscillation, the mirror becomes disentangled with the photon again. So it's basically, if your cantilever starts like this, if the photon is in this cavity, then it, it represents um, a radiation force. So actually, the initial state is out of the equilibrium because it would be something like this with this radiation form. So you start with a certain amplitude, you oscillate around there, and if after one period of, of oscillation the light leaks out, you're back at the equilibrium position without a force. So after one period of oscillation, the mirror actually is back if the photon leaves and is disentangled. So the thing we hope to observe, and then we're not there at all yet, uh, is that the visibility, so the photon leaking out of this interferometer will interfere with itself is, if it's not entangled with the mirror, would, but will not be able to interfere with itself if it's still entangled. So the interference that we measure all on this photon leaking out of the interferometer, and we do this experiment over and over again, we should see visibility at the beginning, and then at the end, after one period of oscillation, the visibility should come back. And the width of this revival if there is no decoherence and this is all pure quantum mechanics, the width depends on the temperature of, on the initial uh, coherent state of the <coughs> mirror. And the lower the temperature, 
the wider this width. So if we could start very close to the ground state, this would almost be the cosine. Um, so it's important that the temperature of the cantilever, the fundamental mode of the resonator, is at very low temperatures to aim of observing any signal after one period of oscillation. So the effective temperature of the fundamental resonator has to be as low as possible. And that's where we need optical cooling for. Um, the requirement that a single photon has enough momentum to displace uh, the mirror uh, by more than its ground state wave packet, and the fact that from the beginning we wanted to do an, an optical experiment, we looked in the parameter range that were possible, so we looked at where do we get the best possible coatings, and this is the type of coating we use uh, now. Um, what type of systems can we put in a, in a, at very low temperatures, and what would be the corresponding frequencies that we need? So um, those parameters we, we are aiming for with our particular experiments. Other groups are aiming for reaching the ground state, and if that is your goal, okay, go to as high as possible frequencies you can get, and you will reach your ground state. Um, but that is not the game we are playing. Okay. We have to overcome uh, environmental decoherence, and this was one of the initial main worries. Um, if you look at the standard environmental-induced decoherence a la Zurich, uh, it implied that we should have given the quality of the resonators, the best ones, uh, known at that time were 10 to the fifth, we had to be um, around a few millikelvin for the bulk temperature of the system. That is not the optically cool temperature, but the bulk temperature of the system. Of course, recently the Qs went up significantly higher, which reduces the, the need for, for going for those extremely low temperatures. But that was the outset of, of our experiment. Stability is extremely important, um, and that is probably, in the end, our major, uh, the main, the main uh, uh, task to uh, to struggle with. Um, we have extremely good background if you work in a in a cryost cryostat, as was noted before. So, collisions with background particles, any collision with the cantilever would destroy this type of experiment. But working at these low temperatures, that will not uh, happen. So, how much time do I still have? I okay, good. <laughs> that will do, that will do. Okay, so it's, um, I'm not going to show how we make uh, those mirrors, um, although it definitely um, is, is an art, and uh, Dustin Kleckner there's a lot of credit for all the hard work on making this uh, work. Um, as I said, the different we have different samples aiming for some higher frequencies, just probing the stability of these structures. And um, at room temperature, certain structures have very high Qs, and optical finesse is fine. The problem is when you want to cool something down, um, you have to clamp it, you have to cool it. Um, it's not guaranteed that those structures will will survive. So we have um, we have a special way of mounting them using some soft uh, gold films, and uh, but that also influences the damping somewhat. Um, so the Q actually changes if we cool down uh, one or two orders uh, of magnitude, and we're trying to understand that. And it has all to do with how are you communicating to the rest of the world through these small arms. And there are actually quite a lot of theorists interested in, in how this works. They are thinking that the surface has dangling bounds. There are two level systems. If you move this object, those will be excited. And you you're have to describe the decoherence of such a structure in terms of coupling to a spin bath rather than the coupling to uh, a bath of harmonic oscillators. So um, I think that's an interesting spin-off of this, this work that we're looking into. Um, another important aspect is just from basic optics, how good of a cavity can we expect if we start with a tiny mirror? And um, surprisingly, that has not, or maybe not so surprisingly, that is not studied in, in the literature carefully. How does diffraction work out for a cavity where you deliberately take a tiny mirror? 
people just have not done that. There was you, you shouldn't use a tiny mirror if you want a good optical cavity. <laughs> okay, so um, we developed uh, a nice way of, of partially analytically, partially numerical uh, calculating the properties of these mirrors as function of the size relative to the beam waist and, and, and the radial length. And um, we basically see that uh, for the fundamental mode, these are the optical finesses you can get. There are some resonances because certain, uh, you will get certain coupling to other modes uh, that help confining the light. And, and if that coupling is not there, uh, you uh, re reduce the finesse again. Um, but those, this, these, those finesses we would be happy with. Um, then we looked at the effect of defocusing. So if the mirror is not, if the small mirror is not exactly at the center of the curved mirror, um, we can uh, simulate that as well. And the conclusion there is that we actually have to align these cavities to a few nanometer accuracy to get to the very high finesse. So that's something to be aware of. Um, uh, and then the biggest surprise for us was that the major trouble in making these cavities good is not the small mirror, but the large mirror. It is surface roughnesses that will eventually scatter the light off the small mirror. So um, we have to have super polished substrates, and even then um, we think that the finesse of these configurations will be limited by the surface quality. And there are people that actually use MBE machines to to first measure atomic scale or few atomic scale um, deformations and then correct it by extra depositioning. So I, maybe we have to go that way to really get uh, the highest finesse. Uh, but, but this is um, probably where the main optical chance is. OK, then the cooling techniques. This is a, also a very old slide, very naive. Uh, standard is 50 millikelvin. Nuclear demagnetization is 50 microkelvin. And you do optical cooling, and you're in the ground state. Um, it doesn't work that way. So we, we, we were one of the first to test optical cooling uh, just from room temperature. And then we want to apply this in the system where we have a dilution refrigerator. Um, we, use, we want to use, or we partially use, uh, a copper block that we have a superconducting magnet around so that you get, uh, you cool down with the dilution fridge while applying a magnetic field. So the nuclear spins are all aligned. Then you disconnect, the, there's, you can have a heat switch, you disconnect this block from basically the 10 to 20 millikelvin dilution refrigerator, and then you slowly reduce the magnetic field. Then you get what is called entropy cooling. Uh, the entropy uh, increases and the temperature goes down. And by that way, we have then a tiny lead from here to the actual substrate that holds the mirror in, in, a, in a way that is isolated from the bench, which is all, also pre-cooled by, uh, by the dilution fridge. So that's, that's the design of the structure. Here is some of the initial stage of this uh, system. Um, the dilution refrigerator works very nicely and the nuclear stage cooling also works very nicely. So if there is nothing in the system, we, we know we can reach 100 microkelvin. Um, we have to have vibration damping. This was the first design that didn't work. This works much better. Um, and our last efforts, we, uh, we did optical cooling. I don't have to explain the, the optical cooling methods. They have been discussed several times. Um, what you do expect is you find your, your mechanical resonance and as a function of the, the, the cooling power, or in our case, how far you displace the laser on, on the sideband, uh, you would, as you saw in the previous talk, you should um, have a broadening of the peak and a shift, actually, which wasn't visible in the previous. Here you see that uh, we, we expect a strong uh, optical spring shift of the frequency. And uh, what we saw recently, and that's not, not yet understood, is this is the peak we start with. So first of all, I should point out that this was done um, 
with the dilution refrigerator on, so there's additional um, uh, noise, and with the, the cooling beams on through the optical fiber. And um, what we saw that in this run, we actually are heating the entire setup with the optical beams that we use. And, and we know we can reduce that by at least two or three orders of magnitude and by better designing the optics. So um, we, we, uh, we are able to, th that was the main part for this run. Actually, you have to cool down the structure with all the optics changing. And so you have all these motors to keep control of your cavities. Because if you lose the alignment, you, you're stuck. You have to heat up and so forth. So you cool down, and then the motors that we have are not piezo driven, but they are in designed in such a way that once you are at the right alignment, you can turn them off. So you don't introduce additional heating and you don't introduce additional vibration. So that part has been holding us up for quite some time. That part is working. Um, but now we have this uh, slightly undesirable initial point of 800 millikelvin. And again, I'm, I'm sure we can reduce it quite a bit. Then we start doing the cooling. And um, here we go to a Q of 400 at 80 millikelvin. And it goes quite a bit lower. Um, but the problem is that we see um, additional features. It seems that although we do passive cooling, that there is some active component in the cooling, which is, shouldn't be there from the simple theory. And um, I also did not mention that we actually do use the nuclear states as a, as a heat reservoir. So um, it could well be that the temperature of the cantilever um, because it, it slowly comes in equilibrium, that the temperature is um, significantly lower than the bulk temperature that we measure on, um, on the copper block. So we, we are very puzzled at the moment how to describe this behavior. These are uh, modes that are actually based from the, the silicon nitride uh, main frame in which the crossbars are. They are disturbing us, that's, but I, I don't think, because on other samples they were further away, we saw the same, uh, the same features. So right now we're, we're trying to understand this, and it seems that there is some squeezing taking place, um, but we are doing a passive cooling, so that's why I was interested in Marcus, um, if you pump harder, you are actually also doing some squeezing, but if that should be a symmetric curve, then I would not uh, expect expect this. Um, so we also, we have of course stabilization electronics, but they should, at these frequencies of 100 kilohertz, they should not play a role, but we, we have to look at it very carefully. So right now we're analyzing this and, and we think, uh, well, we don't quite know where we are, but this is what we would estimate at the moment uh, that, we, uh, that we reach with our current system. Um, yeah. Talking about how you get the line. How do you, what are you actually measuring? How are you turning the meters squared? Okay, okay. So um, you actually have, um, uh, you, you also have modulation signals, so to get certain frequencies. And um, in fact, we there have been several calibration measurements of the amplitude. and. So you sit on, on the, the edge of a resonance. And we basically, because our structure are these cross -res resonators, we can put a, director, a detector right behind it. So we measure transmission uh, of that, uh, that frequency, uh, that, that light. And um, so the only thing we need is an, is a, an absolute measure of, of frequency. And that we do by generating some sidebands with some AOM uh, modulation. No, it does not have this form. No. Yeah. Yeah. No. We we did look at the at those data. Yes. So we're now analyzing all the the noise levels in our system. Obviously, that's what you have to do. And um, so far, um, we haven't found a proper explanation of this. Yeah. 
do uh, the white noise level? Uh, you know, uh, that, that's that's. Is it well, like shock noise or is it laser intensity noise? It's laser intensity noise okay. still. Yes. Yes. So I mean, it's at least some mechanisms that are known that will give you things. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. You can swatch the laser intensity noise. Yes, um, but you wouldn't do that with a passive cooling method. I would have thought you would have actually. Uh, but in the end, the, uh, the kind of the passive cooling is uh, essentially acting to uh, uh, it's moving the mirror in antiphase with the laser intensity. Would it this give this this asymmetric curve? Well, okay. Uh, yeah. you know, the, I'm not sure. Yes. Does it look exactly like Okay, well, um, so, but that, that would mean you would squash the laser noise? Is that what you... Um, no, I, I'm pretty sure that, um, that, we, that Evan Jeffrey looked into that. That was one of the things we discussed. Uh, so, but we have to look into that. Okay, but so that's roughly where, where we at. Um, and so, as I said, work in progress, and I'm keen to hear more advice on how to analyze this data. Thank you for your attention. Yes, um, so that, that is the typical question that Roger Penrose always has to fight. I've, I've been at a talk where also David Gross was, and from the beginning on he was just knocking like this. Uh, um, uh, later on I, heard, I, I learned that that's his general mode if anyone gives a talk, but, but he asked this question, uh, why, for what, what is the special about gravity? And I think the main reason for this is is something else that Roger Penrose never explains, and that is that he spent all his life on what is called twister theory, and um, that is uh, a different way of describing known physics. Um, you use x, y, z, and t as coordinates in usual language. He uses twisters as coordinate, and a twister has six parameters and basically characterizes a light ray in real space. So. If you do that, if you reformulate your fi- all the physical laws in twister language, you can write Maxwell's equation in twister language, Einstein's equation, then um, you get back the same structure of space-time, but on top of it, you have a phase ambiguity. So this mapping leaves open the possibility of having a, a complex number at each space-time point. So that's why Roger Penrose thinks that quantum mechanics is embedded in space-time structure. And all other fields that he describes, like electromagnetic fields, are just living on, in to- on top of that. So that makes all the other interactions at a complete different level than the combination of quantum mechanics and, and uh, general relativity. So uh, quantum mechanics or, or general relativity or gravitational forces are really completely different from all the other forces. Um, and I think there are actually recently strong debates whether gravitational forces actually exist. They, they emerge there as, as ent- entropy uh, forces in, in recent theories. And that, that's actually taking off very rapidly. Uh, there are many, many talks on that uh, these days.